No preamble videos this week since I'm visiting home, but what I can offer is a video of my dog Eli. What's going on, little man? How are you? Much friendlier than usual this week, I see. Well, thanks for watching on YouTube. Hope you enjoyed the dog video. Cannot trust a one. Another one? With a potentially interesting Agatha Christie adaptation due to release in a few weeks, I felt it would be worthwhile to visit a film from a few years back, the 2017 adaptation of Murder on the Orient Express. It features Christie's world-famous detective, the Dutch Hercule Poirot, trying to solve a perplexing murder on board a train he had intended to take on as a holiday. At the time of its release, it received relatively mixed reviews, though they were leaning slightly positive. After watching the movie, I can certainly see where this comes from, as the film has its highs and lows, some points mysterious in all the ways a classic whodunit should be, and at other times confusing in many ways a thriller shouldn't be. Of course, it is challenging to adapt the more detailed medium of novels to screen, but there has already been a successful version of the movie released in 1974. I'll probably always be a fan of a good murder mystery, though, so who am I to complain? Whodunits have been on my brain recently as I work on some final tweaks to a story of my very own. It's a script I am not ashamed of immediately upon finishing it, which is pretty high praise of myself as far as I'm concerned. Overall, the process of crafting that story and everything that went into it gave me a much deeper appreciation for the genre and its standout entries. Movies like Knives Out, Seven, or even the original Scream all nail the staples of a whodunit and do it in very satisfying ways. Everyone knows how cheap a reveal can feel when it comes out of nowhere or it feels unmotivated, and some twists manage to not even make much sense, worst of all. Such as, and without all due respect, a movie like Now You See Me, where Mark Ruffalo is revealed to be in on the crime gang for some reason. Even when the twists don't necessarily reveal a solution to a problem, they can work well. See a movie like The Prestige for an example of these unresolving reveals that still work. But these empty and unsatisfying reveals that can be thrown at the audience out of nowhere are things to specifically avoid when crafting a story. Certainly make a reveal surprising, but have it feel reasonable and within the realm of possibility for the story. Reveals like those in Fight Club or The Sixth Sense are famous because of how they can completely change your perspective on the previous events of the film. Everything that happens still makes sense, it still feels motivated, but it takes on an entirely new meaning with this new knowledge and can give you a greater appreciation for the smaller details or little interactions earlier in the film. None of this is more true than in a great murder mystery, where the entire premise of getting the audience's asses in theater seats is that you're going to go on a ride that you have a small chance of figuring out, and the conclusion is going to wrap everything up nicely in a neat little bow. And that's what makes the murder mystery a fun genre. The audience, in a very loose definition of the term, is involved in the story and invested in it. They want to be proven right, they want to be vindicated with their assumptions. When you're watching, you pay close attention to where everyone is at each point in time, what sort of items or clues might be lying about to incriminate each character, and how each interaction reveals something new about your ensemble cast of would-be murderers. It's a slow IV drip of information puzzle pieces a viewer can put together to find the shape of a missing piece, the killer or perpetrator, before it's revealed to them. Do it right and your audience is on the edge of their seat, paranoid about nearly every member of the cast with their minds racing with potential solutions and three different theories at once of who might be up to what at any given point in the film. Do it wrong and every viewer has given up trying to solve your convoluted plot, as they feel you've given them an unfair game to play, one they never really had a chance at winning. This can be doubly frustrating if the solution is touted to be some clever and one-of-a-kind item that they should have seen coming. Now, I am rambling on about this, because I know, for as difficult as it may be to try and solve a murder mystery as a member of the audience, it is all the more challenging to plot one out as a creator. In addition to keeping track of every minute detail in your story, you've also got a responsibility to the audience. You need to give them enough information, but not smack them over the head with it. You need to give them fair warnings and signs of who did you or done it, but sprinkle in enough red herrings and potential misdirections along the way to make it an actual challenge. You need to toe the line between respecting your audience and giving them as much information as they could reasonably need, while also being sure that they actually had a chance to pretend to be Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot or Inspector Gadget for a brief moment. And trust me, it is very difficult to discern what is reasonable or not when you've known exactly how it all plays out since the very beginning. All this tangent is to say, while the 2017 adaptation of Murder on the Orient Express 
doesn't stick the landing with a perfect 10 out of 10. It certainly has enough bright spots to make it a valiant effort, and a potential jumping off point for other adaptations of classic Christie works down the road, from the capable mind of Kenneth Branagh. The main thing that bogs Murder on the Orient Express down is its feeling of plodding along without much purpose. For a murder mystery, it does take an awful while for the film to get to both the murder and the mystery. While I understand there's a lot of novel to adapt, 256 pages to be exact, I don't feel this is enough of a reason for our marquee attraction to take place 34 minutes into the film's runtime, which is over a quarter of the way through it. Certainly, you can take your time establishing characters and motivations up to this point, and if done well, it feels like everything is building to this moment along the way. But I felt, by the time of the murder, I knew the name of the victim and only truly understood the character of Perot, his assistant Book, and the victim. Everyone else seems to have gotten roughly 30 seconds of time for me to get my bearings on them before things kicked off. It felt like an introduction without substance, as there wasn't a ton of reason up front for you to latch onto any of these characters or their established personalities. One egregious example of this is Willem Dafoe's character, who is in fact very interesting, but you wouldn't know this until roughly two-thirds of the way through the movie, because no one bothered to give him any substantive screen time before this. I feel as if the main issue with the first third of the movie is best displayed through a brief sequence before the Orient Express makes its departure from the boarding station. Here you can see Perot and one of the passengers, the widowed Mrs. Hubbard, conversing as they pass through the train. The shot is set up to follow them along as they move through the cars toward their cabins within the train. While it follows the conversation, it is also intended to have two other purposes. One, to look cool. And the other, a more important purpose, is to give the viewer a sense of geography for the train on which the rest of the film is about to take place. There is but one issue with that, though. Since the camera is following Perot and Mrs. Hubbard from the outside of the train, you can barely see much of anything. Roughly half of the interior of the train is completely cut off by its own walls and lack of windows. Lines and interactions between the two characters are happening essentially off-screen as you have no way to see them through the metal exterior of the train. All you really gather from this shot is that the train is in fact train-shaped and has many long-distance train amenities that you would expect to find in a long-distance train, such as beds, a dining area, a bar, and cushy seats. In other words, nothing you didn't already know about the generic premise here, but with a method of delivery that can only serve to confuse. This is the main feeling of most of the initial character interaction as well. Yes, I understand they are all suspects in this story, but if you aren't telling me why and how these people could have done it until we're two-thirds through the movie, I'm not really being told anything about these characters. Hmm, we learn that the character Debenham is keeping secrets. This is juicy, but considering it's really the only incriminating information we learn up to the one hour mark in the movie, it doesn't really help the audience very much. Hell, we just saw the crime scene for the first time 12 minutes ago, when there was roughly only an hour left of movie to go. The pacing through the first half of the movie is far too leisurely considering what it should have been setting out to accomplish, and I think the rest of the mystery and investigation suffers because of it. New clues are unable to be drawn out and played with fully, and every interrogation seems half-hearted, as Perot rarely seems to want to dig for information. Now, granted, he is supposed to be on vacation, so I can understand the lack of motivation here, but with a killer on the loose, you'd think he might be a bit more urgent with it all. Perot's sense of duty and obligation into working these sorts of cases is an interesting idea that is explored in this story, and I felt it was one of the better aspects of the film. The main idea developed through the movie is how Perot is almost never able to escape his work and just enjoy himself and relax. He is for once given an opportunity to do so when traveling between one job and the next, but even this turns into a crime for him to solve. This force of responsibility ostensibly ruins his mini-vacation, and you can see and feel through most of the movie that Perot really just wants a break. Though he sees things as right and wrong, a black and white morality, this lack of a break is actually one of the best things that can happen to him. Perot considers himself a dispenser of justice that would otherwise die in darkness, and it is a point of pride for him to be able to perform this service for those who would otherwise not receive this kind of justice. He'd sooner die than help a criminal in the beginning, and this is his greatest flaw. As someone who views the world in black and white, his initial denial of assisting a criminal who soon turns into a murder victim is a dose of reality for him. The world, in fact, is not always black and white, and his inaction allowed someone to die, criminal or not. As he reconciles with legality not equating perfectly with morality, the solution to the case pushes him further to this realization and epiphany. The murder was a vengeance for the killing of a child in the past, something not even Perot can deny feels like justice. As he uncovers the plot and the forces behind the murder, he is forced to adapt and recognize that sometimes allowing those harmed to have their catharsis and get their due is the closest we can get to a better and more fair world. Seeing the world in black and white, Perot is forced to consider these shades of gray and come to peace with them before he disembarks the Orient Express.
This is made believable by the convincing performances of every passenger aboard the Orient Express. Brownell, most of all, as an eclectic and distinct incarnation of Perot. He was obviously having fun in the role and hamming it up much more so than any of the other actors, which is really saying something. He comes off as likable and despite being one of the classic detectives, creates a unique spin on the genius savant detective trope. Someone who just wants to do something other than be a genius, even if just for a few days. For this, I'm interested to see him again in Death on the Nile in a few weeks. Hopefully this time, with less strange camera choices and a more streamlined mystery that needs less backstory to establish the world of the detective. Perot's sidekick, Bwok, was also a fun interpretation of a Watson archetype. He is essentially a man of vice who can be honest with Perot, and Perot never expects anything of him, so it's a nice dynamic that they both enjoy. Finally, it was nice of Kenneth Branagh to give Daisy Ridley a chance to do something other than star in a half-baked trilogy of movies that didn't give her much to do or act with, despite being the main character in said movies. Additionally, I found the set design and atmosphere of the Orient Express to really envelop me in the story the further it went along. I'm a sucker for warm natural lights like candles or oil lamps clashing against the cold mountain blues of the environment especially when I get to see it alongside a very well-dressed cast in classy suits and lavish gowns. Some of the shot composition really helped with this, such as some overhead shots aboard the train that I thought gave a fun look at the geography of the cars, but these felt underutilized overall. My closing argument is that Murder on the Orient Express is a competent entry into the genre, though it certainly could have done Agatha Christie more justice. I've never read the original book the film was based on, but the movie has sparked my interest enough to make me want to give it a shot. And Then There Were None was my first foray into these sorts of murder stories, and the only summer reading book that I ever enjoyed in high school. Thematically, Orient Express feels like the yin to that novel's yang, which is a very nice thing for me to feel like I picked up on. It's nice to see that Christie is so renowned for a reason, and not just someone who can give a clever plot, but also put an overarching idea behind it. She does seem to be full of great ideas, though, so again, I am excited to see what Brana can do with Death on the Nile. Though I am certainly cautious considering the marketing team put line deliveries like this front and center in their trailer. This is the part where I play Gal Gadot going, with enough champagne to drown the Nile. And enough champagne to fill the Nile. If you're a fan of the genre, check this movie out if you haven't already. It's a solid three out of five, and I'm open to suggestions of what I should see next week. But then again, I might just crawl further up my own ass and talk about my own writing, the process behind that, and what sort of outputs and milestones there are along the way for someone who wants to write a screenplay. So, until next time.